this is the story of two men. One of them lived in the 1600s, the other in the 1100s. One of them, the first, was the bastard son of the Scottish King. Robert Stuart was the son of James V by his mistress. And although he couldn't be given any high office of state, his loving father did appoint him as Earl of the Orkneys. And he came here determined to make his mark, to live as he would wish to live, despite the fact that the Orkneys were a poor part of the realm. And so he started to build this palace which you see behind me, a magnificent structure incorporating all the latest developments in Renaissance architecture and refinement. To build it, he had to tax the poor people of the Orkneys almost into the ground. And naturally, they resented it. Robert was aware of this, but he didn't care. Instead of windows on the lower story, he put gun loops for muskets and cannons. In due course, he was followed by his son, Patrick, who was even more arrogant than he. A cruel, vindictive, vicious man whose rages were legendary, during which he would tear his hair and shout insults at everyone about him. In order to maintain his lifestyle, he engaged in a series of exactions, robberies, kidnappings, even murder, armed attacks on his neighbors, until finally, the king lost patience and he was arrested and taken to Edinburgh where he was put in prison. But even prison didn't change him. And he sent a message to his son, another Robert, asking him to win back the family estates, which Robert did by engaging in a revolt. And the end was that Robert and his father were both executed for treason. Thus ended the dynasty of the Stuart Earls of Orkney. For the story of the second, I've brought you here to the Broch of Birse, an island, well, it's a peninsula. It's a peninsula for two hours every side of low tide. And you can see down there the little narrow causeway that links the island to the mainland. The rest of the time it is an island, cut off from the rest of the world. Out on the island there is a monastery, and it was there that the second man spent his childhood. His name was Magnus, his father was Erland, so naturally he was, father, he was Magnus Erlandson. His father was one of the Earls of Orkney. His mother wanted him to have an education, and so she sent him out to live with the monks on the Broch of Berse to receive an education and a training there. I am walking among the remains of Viking Age houses out here on the Broch of Bursi. And it may have been in some of these houses that young Magnus Erlandson lived while he was studying at the monastery. Because this is where he was brought up, this is where his mother sent him to receive an education in reading, in writing, in the arts, and above all else, in Christianity in the religion which the Vikings had adopted only a few years before. This little building is the church, the church belonging to the monastery where Magnus Erlinson studied. Down the end, you have the apse where the divine mysteries are celebrated. And on either side are benches where the brothers of the monastery and the students from the school could sit listen to and take part in the services. And it was doubtless here, in this little church, that Magnus Erlinson learned the Psalms and learned to love them. Learned them by heart. And what is more important, <laughs> learned the melodies associated with them. Because each Psalm had its own plain chant. And Magnus Erlinson learned to sing the Psalms. Magnus' idyllic existence here came to an end when the Norwegian king swept down to take possession of all the islands off the coast of Britain. And of course the Orkney Islands were among those he took possession of. He dethroned, if you want to put it that way, he dethroned Earl Erland and his brother Paul, 
sent them into exile in Norway where they died after only a year or two and took their two sons, Magnus and Haken, with him as he carried on south, capturing and asserting his sovereignty over the islands, the Isle of Man, the islands of the Hebrides. And finally, he came to the island of Anglesey off the coast of Wales. It was an island because you have the thin Menai Strait running between the Anglesey and the mainland. What he didn't know was that just days before he had arrived, the Normans, sweeping up from England, had captured the island of Anglesey and driven out the king, the native Welsh king. <laughs> they thought they were attacking the Welsh. They were actually attacking the Normans. And it was here that Magnus Erlandsson did something incredibly brave. Because as the other Vikings were arming themselves for the battle and his cousin Paul, uh, Hakon was also arming himself, Magnus refused. The king said to him, why, why are you delaying? Quickly, get ready. The battle is about to start. And Magnus said, no, I have no quarrel with the people there. Why should I attack them? Why should I seek to do them harm? Why should I try to kill them? And so he stayed on the ship. And according to the story, he spent his time singing psalms while the battle was raging on the shore. Now, that takes tremendous courage to go against what everyone else around you is doing. It takes tremendous courage to be the only one to stand for your convictions. Magnus had that kind of courage. It cost him the favor of the Norwegian king. Before this, he'd been appointed cupbearer to the king. Now the king despised him and treated him with contempt. And only a few days later, Magnus found it expedient to slip over the side of the ship and run away into the woods wearing nothing but his undergarments, which, let me tell you, in this weather requires a different sort of courage. With Magnus in disgrace and disappeared, he was in fact in exile with the King of Scotland, King Magnus Bearlegs of Norway had no hesitation in appointing Hakon Paulsen, Magnus' cousin, to be the sole Earl of Orkney. He accompanied the King on many of his expeditions, but he wasn't with him at his death. Instead, he was ruling here in Orkney and enjoying the experience. But once Magnus Bearlegs was dead, Magnus Erlandsson decided to reclaim his patrimony. Both their fathers were dead, of course, but he came back here with his retainers and applied to the Ting, the sort of parliament. And they agreed that it was only right and just that he should have his father's share of the patrimony. And so, like it or not, Hakon had to divide Orkney with his cousin. Things went peaceably. For about 14 years, the two cousins coexisted. There were tensions, there were agreements, there were good times and bad times, but on the whole, it worked. Until two men came from outside and began to whisper in Hakon's ear, suggesting that really, Orkney would be better with just one earl. And unfortunately, Hakon chose to listen to these evil men. He began to cause trouble for his cousin. There were disagreements, raids even. And finally, the two cousins met here at Tingwal, before the Ting, but they both came with all their supporters, bands of armed men, and things looked very tense for a while. It seemed as though there would be an out-and-out -out battle. The elders of the Ting wiser than the two cousins, recognize that war never solves anything and results in a lot of bloodshed, of suffering, of death. And so they came between the two cousins and their armies. They negotiated back and forth and they arranged a peace treaty. And finally Hakon agreed, well, 
It is Lent after all. Let there be peace. But there are a few details that need to be sorted out before we can finally sign the treaty. So at Easter, dear cousin, come and meet me out on the island of Egelsay, just a few miles away, where there was a nice little Viking church. And there we can sort things out, and just to show good faith, we'll both come with just two ships full of unarmed men. And Magnus agreed, and the two brothers parted and went their ways. And so on the appointed day, Magnus and his party set out. They sailed with the tide from Bursi, but as they passed through the narrows between Ein Hallows, the holy island, and the mainland of Orkney, something unexpected happened. Out of nowhere, a wave seemed to rear up and slap against the side of the ship and soaked one man, Magnus Erlandsson. The men in the ship were alarmed at this ominous portent. And Earl Magnus said to them, according to the Orlinga, Orkneylinga, it's not surprising that you should be worried by this, said the Earl, for I think it forebodes my death. It may be what was prophesied about Earl Harkon will turn out now to be true. We had better reckon with the possibility that Cousin Harkon isn't going to be entirely honest with us at this meeting. He didn't realize just how dishonest and dishonorable his cousin was about to be. They had come, according to the terms of the treaty, unarmed. I suppose every man had his dagger, there may have been a sword or two among them. But there were no spears, no shields, no helmets, no mail. They had come to iron out a few details of the peace treaty, not to make war, not for confrontation. No one was surprised that they arrived early. They had come with the tide, whereas Earl Harkon, coming from a different direction, would have the tide against him. They landed, drew their boats up on the beach, and began to mill around, wondering what to do next. And then, round the headland, over there, came not two, but eight boats. And the sun glinted on swords, helmets, shields, spear points of the army of warriors that filled those eight boats. Earl Harkon was not being honest. And with one accord, Magnus and his retainers set off up the hill towards the Viking church that crowned the summit of the island. There they could take refuge and sanctuary. Inside the church, they were safe. It was sanctuary. Not even Earl Hakon would dare to violate the sanctuary of the church. But it was also a trap. They had no food, they had no weapons. And although Earl Magnus' men offered to, to defend the place with their lives if need be, it would have been a hopeless battle. There was no hope of relief, no hope of rescue. And although they could take refuge up in the great round tower, sooner or later, the roof, which was probably of thatch, would be set on fire, and they would be either burned alive or forced to come out. And so Earl Magnus said, no. I'll come out in the morning and surrender to my cousin. It is perhaps hard to picture this church as it must have looked when Magnus and his men were trapped inside here. These walls would have been plastered, perhaps even brightly painted with pictures of scriptural scenes. The gloom of the church closed in by its roof, the peace within its walls, and the armed men waiting outside. As darkness fell and the light faded from the windows on either side, Magnus moved forward into the heart of the church. And here, in front of the altar, he knelt 
and spent the night in prayer because he had behaved honorably. In the Psalms, which he knew so well, Psalm 15, the Victorians call it the gentleman's psalm because it defines what a gentleman should do. And one of the stipulations is he makes an oath to his own hurt and keeps it. And Magnus had come here despite the warning of the wave, despite the forebodings of his men. He was not the man to break the truce. He had a clear conscience before God. What did he pray about as he knelt here through those long night hours? Was it for deliverance? Was it for rescue? Was it for safety for his men? Or was it for perfect resignation to the will of God? But whatever it was, as morning dawned, he told his men to leave him. And one by one, they filed out through the door and were allowed to go down to the beach to their boats and escape. When all his men were in safety, Magnus himself emerged from the church with a shout of ex exultation. Earl Hakon's men seized him and marched him off to where Earl Hakon was waiting to a lonely spot on the other side of the island where his men down at their boats couldn't see, out of sight of the sanctuary of the church. And there he came face to face with the cousin who had betrayed him. This lonely spot, the exact location is said to be marked by that monument behind me, they brought Earl Magnus. He made three increasingly desperate offers to his cousin. The first was that he should go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and promise never to return. Earl Hacken arrogantly rejected the offer. The second was that he should be exiled to the mainland, put in the care of people Earl Hacken could trust and kept there. Again, the offer was rejected. The third and final offer was that Magnus would accept being blinded and kept in Hacken's dungeon, if only his life were spared. Earl Hacken seemed inclined to accept that offer, but those about him, the warriors who'd come with him, the troublemakers who'd stirred up the, the quarrel in the first place, rejected it out of hand and loudly declared that one of the two earls must die and it was up to Hacken to choose which. And not unnaturally, he chose to live, stating that he preferred to live and rule than to die. And therefore, by default, Magnus must die. The question was, who should do the deed? Hacken ordered his armor bearer to kill his cousin. And the armor bearer, all credit to him, refused. Though perhaps what he had in mind was not pity for Magnus, but fear of the blood feud that might ensue. And so Hacken ordered his cook, a man named Schifolf, to carry out the deed. Schifolf was unwilling, but of course, <laughs> he was a very low status person. He did what he was told or he suffered the consequences. And he began to weep at the, at the awful dilemma in which he found himself. And Magnus said to him, don't weep. You can have my clothes as the normal perquisite of an executioner. And I have prayed that God will forgive you after all, Yours is not the guilt. The guilt is that of the one who commands it. And so Schiffolf accepted that he would carry out the execution. The weapon to be used for the execution, the murder, was a battle axe. And in the Orkney Inga, we're told that Magnus said to Schiffolf, stand in front of me and strike me hard on the head. It's not fitting for a chieftain to be beheaded like a thief. Take heart, poor fellow, I pray that God grant you his mercy. With that, he crossed himself and stooped to receive the blow. So his soul passed away to heaven. And the skull of Magnus that has been found bears a fracture just there, indicating that the Orkneyinga is indeed correct. He stooped to receive the blow administered by the cook, Schiffolf.
Magnus was first buried where he was murdered, out on Eaglesay Island. But a few days later, his mother humiliated herself before Earl Harkon, even to the extent of offering to consider him her son, if only he would permit the body of her son to be brought for burial within a Christian church. Grudgingly, Earl Harkon agreed. And the body of Magnus Erlandson was dug up and brought here to Birse, where he was buried, we believe, in the church which formerly stood on the site of this more modern church. And there he remained for many years, 20 years in fact. And almost immediately people began to report miracles taking place. Strange lights shone around his grave. The sick were healed. And the common people regarded Magnus Erlandson as a saint. According to legend, this area where the murder took place was covered in rocks. It was bare, barren ground. But almost overnight it became a green and fertile meadow. And soon miracles began to be reported. Here, where the murder had taken place, and over at Bursi, where Magnus' body was buried. And Magnus became known as a saint. I don't know whether there was any formal process of canonization, but the common people regarded him as a saint, and he is the patron saint of the Orkneys. Strangely, the events which happened here were the making of Hakan. He could not forget what he had done, and gradually he was filled with remorse. He went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem to try and atone for his sin. And when he came back, he began to rule much as his cousin had done, seeking the good of those over whom he ruled. He made good laws. He ex executed justice. And when he died, he is remembered as a good ruler, save for that one dark blot on his name, the murder of his cousin. For 20 years, Bishop William refused to accept that Magnus was responsible for any miracles. He castigated those who claimed that miracles had been wrought. He wouldn't have anything to do with the idea that Magnus might be a saint. After all, Hacken Paulson was in charge, and Bishop William knew which side his bread was buttered. But then Hacken died, and his son Paul, a much weaker character, came to be Earl of Orkney. And at the same time, Roggenwald, the cousin, sorry, the nephew of Magnus over on the mainland began to make noises and signs of power and of desiring to come and be Earl himself. And it quickly became obvious that he would be the next in line. And suddenly Bishop William had a conversion. Well, what actually happened was he claimed that he went blind. <laughs> Easy to claim that you're blind because you can't fake leprosy, you can't fake a broken bone, but blindness, all you've got to do is close your eyes and tell people you can't see them. And he was terribly blind until he went to the shrine of St. Magnus at Bursi and prayed. And suddenly he could see again. And he was now convinced that Magnus was a saint. And in gratitude for the miracle that had been wrought on his behalf, he declared that he was going to build a suitable church for St. Magnus. And you can see it there behind me. The Cathedral of St. Magnus in the middle of Kirkwall, the capital of the Orkneys. The Shrine of St. Magnus remained a popular place of pilgrimage right down through the medieval period until the Scottish Reformation. And I think you can imagine what John Knox's opinion of saints and relics was. The shrine was dismantled, demolished, and the bones, the relics of St. Magnus, disappeared. And it was just assumed that they had been thrown out and discarded and they'd never be seen again.
but in the 1800s the cathedral was in need of repair. And as the workmen were renovating the cathedral, for some reason they had to take some stones out of one of the piers in the cathedral. And behind those stones, don't ask me how it got in there without demolishing the cathedral, but behind those stones was a wooden box. And in the wooden box were some bones and a skull. And the skull had a great big gash just where tradition said that St Magnus had been struck and killed. And there's little doubt that those bones are indeed the bones of St Magnus. They've been put back in the pier. Their position is marked by a cross high on the pier. The box has been kept out. It's now in the excellent little museum directly opposite the cathedral and anyone who wants to can go in there and see it. The bones are not visible and probably never will be again. So there we have the story of two men. One man, violent, proud, arrogant, oppressing his neighbours. The other man, meek, humble, unwilling to fight and kill those with whom he had no quarrel, unwilling to risk the lives of his men in defence of his own. One a saint, one a traitor. Now, of course, you may point out that both are dead. So what's the difference? Well, the answer is that you look at things from God's point of view. Magnus, a saint, will certainly be in heaven, will have the gift of eternal life, will live forever in the presence of God. Stuart, violent, arrogant, proud, is destined for a different place no eternal life, suffering and pain. It does pay to be, as Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth, but the violent and the proud will be destroyed and swept away.